It's the hook. It's like on the uh, grade school playground. Your uh, pusher gives you your first, you know, dose of heroin <laughs> for free. And then they've got you. Hey, Legend, I hope you're holding on to your hat today for this guest that we have coming up, Dr. Robert Lustig. This guy is an absolute powerhouse of a man, and he has written multiple, multiple books, one of them called Metabolic, which is the lure and lies of processed food, nutrition, and medicine, and also one of my personal favorites, which is The Hacking of the American mind. So he really talks about how sugar and our food and the food industry has really infiltrated and hijacked us as you know biological beings and made us addicted to the foods and just being consumers in general. So besides being a little bit, you know, you might be like, oh, this sounds a bit conspiratorial. I'm gonna read off some of this guy's credentials because he is very, very impressive. So he is Professor Emma. Emeritus of Pediatrics, that's a mouthful, at University of California. And he holds a bachelor's in science from MIT, a doctorate in medicine from Cornell, and he has a master's in studies of law in UC Hastings College of the Law. So this guy has a lot of credibility. He's done a lot of research, done a lot of study. And we talk about how he went from being a traditional doctor and still you know, practices medicine, he still does all that sort of stuff, to really understanding how the food industry has infiltrated us and how it's influenced our buying behavior, our food consumption, and really driving us to a society of sickness. So lots of cool stories in this one, lots of information. Hopefully this little intro helps you get prepared to, like I said, hold on to your hats, hold on to your seat. This is a wild ride into the food industry from a man who has really made a big impact in making the world a better place and helping people like you and me being less addicted to our stomachs and our unconscious mind. Rob, thank you for joining us. I'm very excited to jump into this today. My pleasure, Josh. Thanks, man. So first question, love to know, what are you excited for coming up in the next 12 months? What's been something that you're moving forward to that maybe you're looking forward to? Um, I'm working with uh, a uh, former congressman here in the United States who will remain nameless for the moment. Wow. Along with um, a set of NGOs and the New York City Health Department to get soda off of food stamps. Wow, that's a big move. Now, Bloomberg tried to do this when he was mayor uh, 11 years ago, and the USDA rebuffed him. Well, there's more data and things are worse and the USDA is now in a, shall we say, experimenting mood. Mm -hmm. And so we are going to try to implement um, a, uh, a public service campaign uh, across the entire borough of the Bronx, which has the lowest health quality of any county in New York State. They actually have a, an NGO called Not 62 because they come in 62nd out of 62 counties in New York State in terms of health quality and longevity. Wow. And they want to be anything but 62. <laughs> I can't believe that's the name. What a name. What a claim to fame, not 62. And Rob, I'd love if you can just share in a nutshell. I mean, you have an incredible career. You've done so much and you've really contributed a lot to addiction and obesity and, and getting the, the planet healthier at this stage. You have such a broad reach. But what did you well, what would you say you're well known for? Well, to be honest with you, Josh, I don't know that the planet's any healthier. Um, you know, I mean, yeah. the data are not uh, uh, particularly, uh, 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 you know, in my favor. Mm. Uh, all I see are things getting worse. Mm. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, in my opinion, my humble opinion, the reason things are continuing to get worse is because we haven't fixed the food. Yeah. Because we think we can fix people. We think we can fix behavior. We think we can fix all sorts of things, but in fact, my research and research of many other people show that the food is the problem. Yeah. And when we went from a real food diet, which is a low sugar, high fiber diet, to a processed food diet, which is a high sugar, low fiber diet, mm. that's what caused this you know, chronic disease debacle worldwide, mm. not just in the United States, not just in the UK, not just in Australia, but everywhere. And um, until we fix the food back, 
or at least until we start employing new technologies to make processed food healthier. By the way, that is a thing, and we can talk about that. Mm. Um, you know, this isn't going to get fixed. Yeah. And so uh, I, I'm optimistic, but I'm also a realist. And, mm. you know, uh, haters going to hate, and, you know, people... <laughs> And people are going to continue to do what they do because they're addicted. Yeah. I, it's it's quite stark, isn't it, that that is the reality, you know, when you travel especially. Like I've traveled a lot through the States and lived in Vancouver, Canada for quite a while and also done Central America, South America, Asia. Since I was like 14, I started traveling and still doing so. I was in Nicaragua just a month ago, living there for six months. Good. And I was blown away at how obese that population is. Yep. Just absolutely shocked. Pick your population. It doesn't matter where. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really like breads, you know, not and not like homemade breads. It was like packets of hot dogs. And some people would just eat a hot dog bun for breakfast with a coffee and just really shocking. Like, is it how did our food from the West, you know, that's become more processed and how did it spread so fast and so far like i was in remote nicaragua like pretty my internet didn't yeah. work half the time but there was well, still mcdonald's and hot dog buns. well it's it's the hook you know mm. it's just like on the uh you know uh uh you know grade school playground you know your uh your your uh, pusher gives you your first uh you know dose of uh heroin mm. for free and then they've got you and that's kind of what the food industry did. They mm. started plying everything with sugar. Now, mm. I'm not sure that in 1980, when this whole thing exploded, I'm not sure that the food industry knew at that moment that sugar was addictive. Mm. But they knew it very soon afterward, if not mm. then, then, then shortly thereafter. And we can prove that because... Colleagues of mine, uh, Tara Fazzino and Laura Schmidt, uh, have just published a paper looking at the change in the food supply from 1982 to 1991, when Altria, which was Philip Morris, bought Kraft General Foods in Nabisco, mm. and what the change in the ultra-processed food and the sugar content of the diet was at that point. So you have to wonder why... Altria bought food companies when it was a cigarette company. Hmm. And the answer was because Crazy. they were going to do the same thing. Because probably because they did recognize that sugar was addictive. Hmm. So in that window, you know, when the obesity pandemic started, which was around 1980, okay, there were, um, shall we say, there was skullduggery afoot. And, um, you know, we're, we're suffering from the, uh, the uh, aftermath of that now. And the b bottom line is sugar is addictive and, um, you know, it's in everything. It's in 73% of the items in the American grocery store. And it was put there on purpose by the industry on purpose because they know that when they add it, you buy more. Yeah. So basically you're making, you're, you're telling people that they have to use cognitive inhibition on addiction. Now, how well does that work? You know, can you tell a heroin addict don't use? Can you tell a cigarette smoker, don't smoke? You know, mm. How well does that work? Not too well. Crazy. Because you can know in your heart of hearts, you can know at your, you know, at your, you know, cerebral cortex that, you know, whatever it is you're addicted to is killing your health, your family, your economy, your community, and you're powerless to do anything mm. with, uh, about it because the drive to use is still so great. Mm. Well, that's what we have. So that's why I say that we're not going to solve this problem until we fix the food. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's really quite frightening, isn't it? Like, I think that the realization that the best minds, like Naval Ravikant said this, he was like, we have the best minds of our generation, like literally programming these foods, our phones and everything to keep us hooked. And then ultimately, as a culture, we're more and more isolated. We're less community-orientated. We're less about the family. And it's like we're just alone in our room against one person, if you can imagine the image of 
10 people in lab coats behind your phone. Like that's really yeah. the, the battle that well, you're fighting. Sher Sherry Turkle, who's a media watcher at MIT, you know, mm. famously coined the term alone together. Wow. That's what we are. We are alone together. Yeah. And believe me, being alone is not what the human condition is about. But that's what we are. Yeah. And people think, oh, I'm not alone. I'm connected digitally. That is, digi digital connection is not connection. Mm. Digital connection, if anything, is the opposite of connection. Mm. Because connection dr uh, drives serotonin generation in the brain. And digital connection drives dopamine wow. in the brain. So, in fact, and, and, and serotonin is the one thing that can counteract dopamine, and dopamine is the one thing that can overwhelm serotonin. Mm. So, in essence, by you know our entire society moving to a cell phone culture, which started in 2007, and you can see the break, you know, in terms of the start of depression, the start of PTSD, the start of cyberbullying, the start of you know virtually all of the mental health issues that we now see, you know, occurred then. So you say, well, okay, that's its own problem. Mm. Well, not actually. It's tied up with the processed food problem. And it turns out that the depression uh, epidemic actually started before 2007. And it started, in fact, because of processed food. Because tryptophan, which is the precursor of serotonin, is the rarest amino acid in the diet. Mm. And it is certainly not found in ultra-processed food. You find it in eggs, chicken, fish. Those sound like processed food to you, not too much. So if you are insulin resistant, your liver takes your tryptophan and actually diverts it to an inactive metabolite, so you have even less serotonin. Wow. And so we have been uh, subjected to a serotonin deficiency for over 50 years, which then got made worse by the uh, cell phone epidemic. Wow. So now we have two problems, not one, that are driving all of our mental health issues. Yeah, it's intimidating. And let's say alone together, that's where we're at. What would you say some first steps of fighting that would be, of getting control back? Because it's like, that's an impossible battle. Me versus 10 guys in a lab coat, I'm losing every yeah. time. How do, yeah. I, how do I win? How do I get my well, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know that you can win unless unless the social media companies actually change the rules. Right. Um, which, of course, is what Congress is, you know, trying to figure out how to do. You know, and the social media companies are saying, you know, they're not a media company. They're just a platform, you know, and they hide behind this one particular uh, uh, rule called Section 230, which basically says that you can't sue the, uh, you know, the, the social media company for your own problems. Yeah. Uh, and that they're immune from any prosecution. This has to change. You know, the minute that the social media companies think that they actually could be liable or culpable in a court of law, that's when you'll start seeing uh, changes on their part. The point is that there need to be guardrails for any new technology. Think about this, okay? The atom bomb, okay, it got exploded in Hiroshima, then it got exploded in Nagasaki. Mm. Has there been a repeat atom bomb explosion since? That's it. We have put all sorts of guardrails in place to keep that from happening. Yeah. All right? Recombinant DNA, okay? It was going to unleash, you know, some sort of monster. Maybe COVID, I don't know, but some sort of monster. As soon as recombinant DNA was invented in the 1980s, 1990s, they rushed to the table to develop technology, uh, not technology, uh, guardrails for their use, mm. you know, that all scientists would have to abide by, all right? CRISPR, you know, gene editing, same thing. As soon as CRISPR was invented, straight to the negotiating table to come up with a treaty for how to use it, all right? So we have a long history of recognizing 
that technology can easily escape us and that we have to do everything we can to rein it in in order to use it properly so that the bad guys don't win. Well, for social media, nothing. Yeah. For AI, nothing. This is a problem. Yeah, big problem. Who are the bad guys? Like when we say bad guys, is it is it just greed? Is it just profit? Well, there's like... there, there's Elon and Mark and you know I don't you know a few others, you know Devin Nunes, <laughs> you know there, there's there's a couple of them. Um, the point is that um, they will tell you that they're doing good, but the question is how do you measure that? And are they actually looking at the bad that they're doing? And the answer is no, they're not. Yeah. So you know, we have a lot of work to do here. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's like sometimes I talk to people about these sorts of things and there's such a, I guess, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Acceptance that someone in authority has the answers and is always doing good. And when you look back in history, these actions like, you know, the food companies, the cigarette company buying the food yeah. companies and, you know, addicting people with sugar – these sort of actions have been happening forever. This is human Indeed. nature. And it's not and it seems to be that a lot of people sit in the now and today and think, well, that's not what it's like today. When it well, seems to be right in front of you. Why is that well, we well, I have mean, these I, lessons I, in history but we can't see it today? All you have to do is look at slavery. Mm. You know, I mean very bad, you know, part of uh human history. But it was for the same reasons. Mm. Addictive substances. Yeah. So, you know, look at the opioid epidemic, you know, ultimately our brains need reward. Okay. Reward is a motivating factor. Reward is what gets you up in the morning. All right. I am not against reward. Mm. Okay. I am against addiction. Mm. So what's the difference between reward and addiction? And the answer is stress. Reward is I like this, even I want this. Reward plus stress equals I need this. Mm. And it's when you need it, when there's no amount of money that you won't pay to get your fix, that's when you fall into the abyss. Mm. And we've done that. We've done that. We've done it with sugar. We've done it with opioids. We've done it with... Um, you know, uh, tobacco. We've done it with alcohol. We've done it with cocaine. We've done it with heroin. You know, you you pick pick your pick your. Uh, oh, and we've done it by the way with shopping, gambling, internet gaming, social media, pornography. I mean, every single one of these things that I've just mentioned activates the reward system. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly egregious in children, mm. in teenagers. And the reason is because the one part of the brain that controls the reward system isn't yet developed, the prefrontal cortex. That doesn't really develop and co incomplete till age 25. So teenagers are particularly susceptible to all of this messaging. And so we are seeing this bout of teenage addiction, teenage depression, teenage PTSD, all because the prefrontal cortex can't control the amygdala and can't control the reward center. Mm -hmm. Is it the same? And if you can embellish me a bit here, I'll talk about my own experience with work. Is it the same with work? Because I find yeah. oftentimes I have a hard cutoff at 7 p.m. that I yeah. basically never stick to. <laughs> it's like, and I, because I'm, and then I go to bed and I'm worked up and I don't get a good sleep and then I'm falling into the cycle again. And it's literally in my calendar. It's grayed out yeah. 7 p.m. And yeah. I really struggle to meet that even if I finish my calls because I'm uh, in sales. So I'm basically sitting there driven by my skill, getting a big reward. I close a deal. I get my commission. Yeah, could you... I, I feel for your brother. I, I, I work in caffeine or my addictions. I get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it the same? Like, because the work isn't... And maybe you could talk about shopping. The, the work well, isn't necessarily like I'm ingesting something. Well, the the, the, the point is that those the uh, work work is inherently productive mm -hmm. you know and you can see some other benefit like money out of that and so you know it's it's the driver but it 
you know, and, and ultimately work could kill you, you know, I mean, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. Just the same way that, you know, cigarettes are going to kill you, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. Mm. All right. It's, it's really no different. Um, the question is, how do you take a pause? Yeah. You know, in the Jewish religion, we have this thing called Shabbat. We have mm-hmm. Saturday where we're not supposed to do any work and we're not supposed to, you know, turn on any lights and we're supposed to, you know, take stock and we're supposed to meditate and pray. And, you know, and the reason for doing that is basically to break the addiction cycle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's actually very healthy. On the other hand, you know, um, plenty of Jews, I know are, you know, are sucked in anyway, like me, you know, it's a, it, it's a problem. Right. It, it remains a problem. But but the point is that this has been known for millennia. I mean, this has been known since there have been people on the planet Absolutely. that this exists and that, that, that this is one of our psychological break points, that this mm-hmm. is one of the, you know, um, sort of neural neurocircuitry failings of the human uh, 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 being. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, unfortunately, companies have learned how to exploit it. Mm. How do you personally, like, what are some things that you do personally to try and stay on track and keep those boundaries in place? It's hard. I'm going to be very honest with you. It's very hard. But some of the things I do, the first thing I do is I eat real food. Mm. Okay. Because I'm keeping my serotonin up because if I keep my serotonin up, then I don't get down. And when I don't get down, then I don't reach for the chocolate and for the, you know, uh, love chocolate. uh, I mean, like I said, my, my addiction, my addiction is caffeine and, you know, I, I just finished my coffee right here, you know, um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I am, I am by no means a paragon of virtue, Mm. but, you know, recognizing the problem is, is half the battle. Yeah. If you don't know you're addicted, how can you stop it? Yeah. So how many people do you know who say, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth? Yeah, I know, for sure. That's that's sugar addiction until proven otherwise. Yeah. Now, do they know they're sugar addicted? They just think they have a horrible sweet tooth. Yeah. Totally. And they also think that they can basically reward themselves whenever they need to. Because number one, it's available. Number two, it's cheap. Number three, it tastes good. Mm-hmm. And number four, they don't know it will kill them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they've been told a calorie is a calorie. Mm. They've been told that it doesn't matter because it's just calories. So yeah. you'll cut back on, you know, the piece of steak you eat, you know, at, at dinner because you had the, you know, uh, the, 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 tr- the Lindor truffles, you know, beforehand. And that, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. That doesn't yeah. work. That just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so, so the bottom line is, um, uh, in order to exercise personal responsibility, which is what we seem to want as a Western society for all of its populace, you know, basically, you know, take the risks, suffer the consequences. You need to be able to satisfy four criteria in order to invoke that ideology of personal responsibility. So here they are. Here are the four criteria. Number one, you have to have knowledge. You have to know what you're doing and you have to know when you're not doing it, what the consequences of that are. We are kept from that knowledge by the food industry. Number two, you have to have access. Well, if you go into the middle of the United States and go to virtually any grocery store or any convenience store, you can't find healthy food. All you find is ultra-processed food because that's what will sit on a shelf, the 10-year-old Twinkie. Okay? So if you don't have access, how can you exercise personal responsibility? Hmm. Number three, affordability. You have to be able to afford your choice and society has to be able to afford your choice. Well, what if you can't afford your choice because that's not what's on food stamps? And what if society can't afford your choice because Medicare is going to be broke by the year 2026 because of all the chronic metabolic disease? And finally, number four, externalities. In other words, how does your consumption, how does your abuse hurt me so for tobacco secondhand smoke for alcohol drunk driving okay what's the secondhand smoke of your sugar consumption Mm. well 
The answer is the death of Medicare and the fact that you can't even access a physician. If you go to the emergency room, you can't even get in because of all the people on gurneys, you know, getting their TPA for their heart attack. Uh, and, and you can't even get into the di dialysis unit <laughs> because of all the diabetic nephropathy and the people basically being kept alive on dialysis because their kidneys are shot because of their diabetes, which the sugar caused. So that's the externalities. So all four criteria that have to be met aren't met. So how do you invoke personal responsibility in that venue? Well, you don't. This is a public health problem. This is not a personal responsibility problem. Wow. But until people recognize that and until politicians recognize that, and we start passing legislation to assist the public, like we did with cigarettes, you know, I don't, I don't see any good coming of this. This is what I mean by you got to fix the food. Yeah, absolutely. Um, shit, there's so many places I want to go next. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'd love to, if when you say real food, would you be able to define that a little bit? Because I think a lot of people would no. have a very different definition of what that means. Sure, I can define it two ways. Anything that came out of the ground or any animal that ate what it came out of the ground. Mm. That's real food. Yeah. Another way to... Uh, uh, to define it, real food doesn't have a label. Yeah. If it has a label, something's been done to it. Okay. Is there a label on broccoli? There's a, is there a label on a radish? Is there a label on an orange? Because mm -hmm. nothing's been done to it. Now, yeah. is there a label on orange juice? Absolutely. Sure. Because something's been done to it. Yeah. The fiber's been removed. Okay. And maybe other things too, but at least that. Yeah. Okay? So the minute the minute a, a real food is subjected to any form of processing, that's when there's a label. Mm. So what you have to do is you have to look at the nutrition facts label as a warning label. Mm. Now the problem with that label right now is that the label only tells you what's in the food. That's not what's important. What's important is what's been done to the food. Because all food is inherently good. It's what's been done to the food that's not. The degree of processing. And that is not listed on the label. Mm. And that's what we need to know. But the food industry doesn't want to tell us that. Because if they told us that, we wouldn't eat it. Which is, of course, correct. But So we are being kept from the information that we actually need to know. Mm. Okay. So how do you fix that? Well, we have a way. We do have a way. I am the chief medical officer of a company called Perfect, P-E-R-F-A-C-T. And you can find it online at perfect.co, not com, but co. And what Perfect is, is it's a digital recommendation engine that works with your grocery store anywhere in the world, okay? We'll actually figure out what's in your grocery store you will put your biochemical profile in. This will activate a set of filters that will filter all the ingredients in that grocery store away so that the only thing that you can see is that which will actually support metabolic health and extend your life as opposed to all the other crap in there that will kill you. Mm -hmm. So you only get to see that which makes you healthy. Mm. So... Could you, would you mind giving us an example when you say like something's been done to the food? Are you talking about pasteurizing, homogenizing? Like what happens to the food when these things have been done to it that allows it to sit on a shelf or even maybe we use milk as an example. I don't drink milk anymore, but it's, a very, it's still in every store. So, so pasteurizing was a good thing because mm -hmm. pasteurizing killed you know, tuberculosis bacteria. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. I mean, that's a food safety issue. Sure. But what we're talking about here is a chronic disease issue. Right. I'll give you an example of something that's been done to the food that matters. Yeah. Okay? Emulsifiers. Now, mm -hmm. what are emulsifiers? Emulsifiers hold fat and water together. So biochemically, they have a polar uh, end on one side and they have a non-polar end on the other side. Okay? So phospholipids, so the... Phospho is the polar, the lipids, the nonpolar. 
And what that does is that holds fat and water together. Okay? Now, where do you use emulsifiers the most? In your clothes washer. They're what take the stains out of your clothes. Tide. Okay, I don't know. Maybe you don't have Tide in uh, I know what a Tide is. Yeah. You know what Tide is. <laughs> tide yeah. pod, right. Okay. Now, tide is an emulsifier, okay? So an emulsifier is a detergent. That's right. Holds fat and water together. So what happens if you swallow an emulsifier? What happens if you swallow a Tide Pod? I mean, I can taste it in my mouth as we're talking about it. So I can't just, just can't well, what imagine happens anything to your good. Test? Yeah. Burns a friggin' hole in your intestine. It's a disaster. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why the Tide Pods, which actually look like candies, you know, the toddlers are, you know, are uh, drawn to and have had numerous poisonings, you know, from this. The point is that emulsifiers strip the mucin layer off your intestinal epithelial cells. Now, that is one of the three barriers that you have in your intestine. Wow. To keep all the bad stuff in your intestine and not in your bloodstream. Right. You know your intestine is a sewer, mm. okay? Literally a sewer, a pipe with shit in it. Okay, that is the definition of a sewer, all right? Now, the goal of the intestine is to keep the shit in the intestine and not let the bad stuff into the bloodstream while at the same time being able to extract nutrients that you do need so that you can get those into your bloodstream so that you can basically power all your cells. Yeah. Fair? Makes okay. perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. That is the definition of an intestine, mm. okay? A sewer. Now, there are three barriers in the intestine to keep the bad stuff out of you. There's the physical barrier, the mucin layer. There is the bio, uh, biochemical barrier, which are called tight junctions. They are proteins that hold the cells together so that they don't separate and so that bad stuff can't get in between because... The tight junctions are functional. Got it. Then, and finally, there's the immunologic barrier. There's a bunch of TH17 lymphocytes, which are programmed to basically fight off foreign invaders. And they release a cytokine called IL-17. So you have three barriers, a physical, a biochemical, and an immunological barrier. Hmm. Emulsifiers to strip the mucin layer right off the surface of your intestinal epithelial cells. And you can actually see it in an electron microscopy that after an emulsifier has worked, the bacteria in your intestine, which are supposed to be separated from your intestinal cells, mm. they're sitting right on top of them. And so they can leak, they can you know, create um, uh, local ulcerations. This is almost assuredly the cause of irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory mm. bowel disease. That's and it's been shown that when you take people with IBS or IBD and you switch them to real food, their IBS and their IBD get better. Mm. So the ultra-processed food is one of the primary reasons why IBS and IBD have continued to increase in prevalence. Wow. And, and okay, so that, yeah. that's one thing. And it's not the only thing, but it's, it's one thing. Yeah, that's now, crazy. That, that biochemical barrier, the tight junctions, okay? Those tight junctions are proteins. The, the famous one, uh, the famous tight junction is zonulins, and zonulins are what fail in celiac disease, okay? Yeah. And, you know, um, all of the tight junction proteins need ATP, okay, to stay uh, functional. Well, sugar actually depletes ATP from intestinal cells. In addition, Fructose, the, the sweet molecule in sugar, nitrates those tight junction proteins so they don't work as well. So they're supposed to hold things together. Well, guess what? Now they separate. Now you get a functional leaky gut. And so things can pass through. And now they end up in your uh, bloodstream. If they end up in your bloodstream, they can cause inflammation. Or possibly even you could develop an allergy. You could develop an allergy to a specific food mm. because... You, you know, an antibody, uh, you know, generating cell now recognizes this, you know, piece of uh, uh, peptide as foreign, and now you now you're off to the races in terms of a, a food allergy. 
Wow. <coughs> All right. <So>, yeah. <clears throat> and then the immunologic barrier <clears throat> in the TH17 cells turns out high fat diets maintain that TH17 barrier. High fat, high sugar diets cause that barrier to be destroyed. Right. And then everything just dumps in. So basically, the Western diet is obesogenic, it's immunogenic, it's inflammatory. Mm. It's basically everything we don't want it to be. Yeah, that's crazy. But this is what 90% of the food in the world is right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? And that you can develop an allergy seems mind-blowing. You know, it's like people... Well, you go through your life and all of a sudden... Allergy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> didn't used to. Yeah. Well, and is that because of the things like the emulsifiers and whatnot or? Yeah. Wow. Yep. That's crazy. So, so, you know, just, you know, sort of substituting this ingredient for that ingredient is sort of missing the point. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to re-engineer the food entirely. Yeah. To be yeah. metabolically healthy. Now, here's the good news. We published a paper, colleagues of mine and I published a paper in March of this year in Frontiers in Nutrition, which is actually the roadmap for food companies to be able to make their ultra-processed food metabolically healthy. They have to adhere to three simple precepts. Protect the liver, feed the gut, support the brain. Yep. Those are the three things that a real food would do that causes metabolic benefit. Mm -hmm. Protect the liver, feed the gut, support the brain. Yeah. Ultra-processed food does none of them. So ultra-processed food is poison. Mm. But could you take ultra-processed food and re-engineer it so that those three criteria could be met? And the answer is, yes, it could. You could do that if you knew what you were doing. Mm. Well, we have done that. So a company in the Middle East if you will, the Nestle of the Middle East. The name of the company is called KDD or Kuwaiti Danish Dairy Company. Approached me three years ago and recognized that they were part of the problem and that they wanted to be part of the solution. And so they asked me to convene a scientific advisory team, which I did. And the five of us, for the next three years, worked on all the criteria that would have to be met all of the biochemical analyses that would have to be done, all of the um, <clears throat> um, tiers systems set up in order to be able to grade. And basically, we developed the method for being able to overhaul a processed food company oh, wow. so that their fare could be metabolically healthy. And KTD, to its credit, has taken our work, and they have now turned over... 10% of their uh, uh, of their portfolio That's to metabolically healthy products. Wow. That's now, incredible, man. Two, two companies have reduced their sugar content in their food. Okay? Danone and PepsiCo reduced the sugar... Oh, sorry, Danone and Nestle. No, not PepsiCo. Danone and Nestle have reduced the sugar content of their food by 14%. And they called this a major win. Do you think a 14% reduction is a major win? <laughs> when we are consuming quadruple what our limit is, yeah. do you think a 14% reduction gets you to where you need to go? No. Not even remotely. In the KDD project, we have reduced sugar consumption, the sugar availability in their food by 78%. Crazy. 14%. 78%. <clears throat> you tell me. That's insanity. Yeah. So all of these things, Josh, are doable. It's not that they can't be done. They can. But you have to have the will to do it. You have to have the political will to do it. You have to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Mm. And to be honest with you, the food industry doesn't want to know and the politicians don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. So... So let's say, for example, that help isn't coming. 
and it's up to us. We got to, you know, at an individual level, like, right. you know, make some changes. Could you expand or talk about a calorie not being a calorie, you know, calories in versus calorie as very bro science. Like I grew up <laughs> reading like bodybuilding.com and I was like, sweet, I can just eat whatever I want as long as it meets my macros, you know? Right. And right. just before you answer that question, do you mind ask, answering a quick one? When you think about real food, do you care if it's organic or not? Okay, that's a complicated question. Um, okay. which, which would you like me to answer first? Organic or not first and then we'll move organic it. Organic or not first, okay. There are pesticides and other products that are sprayed onto and added to various foods that definitely alter their um, uh, healthfulness. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, several of pesticides are obesogenic. Wow. And we've written articles on environmental obesogens. Wow. Okay, like chlorpyrifos and. Uh, 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 DDT was, it's, you know, and many others. Um, these um, uh, compounds activate transcription factors within our cells and mimic what our hormones normally do, whether it's the estrogen binding to the estrogen receptor or the androgen binding to the androgen receptor or thyroid hormone binding to the thyroid hormone receptor or something binding to the PPAR gamma receptor. There is about 10 different receptors that are involved in adipose tissue development. And these environmental obesogens can mimic those effects. And so we have the data to show that these can cause problems. Mm -hmm. So the only way to get rid of all of them is to eat organic. Mm -hmm. And that, so that sounds like what you should do. Okay. Problem, of course, is that there's not enough organic food in the world for everybody who right. could want it or need it. In fact, organic food right now is only 1% to 2% of what's available. So that's going to be a problem. So the question is, do you need organic everything? Mm. And the answer is no, you don't need organic everything. If it's produce and it's got a hard skin, like an apple, you can wash it. Okay. And that's good enough. If it's got a soft skin like a berry, mm. then you can't wash it. It's in there. If it's meat, you really want it to be organic. And the reason is because if it's not organic, then that, what that means is it's been treated with antibiotics. Mm. And those antibiotics are still in the meat and they will affect your intestine. Crazy. Killing off good bacteria and letting bad bacteria like methanogens to proliferate. Ugh. And that will ultimately cause metabolic dis disruption in you. So... There are certain things that can be organic, and there are certain things that, uh, you know, that, that, sorry, there are certain things you can buy that are not organic and still be okay. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things that you do have to buy that are organic because okay. of the nature of what the chemicals are. Right. So a blanket statement just by organic is sort of missing the point and also, you know, uh, not scalable and too expensive. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying to be pragmatic and rational in you know my recommendations here. Yeah, absolutely. And so, regardless of what the animals, like let's say a cow, for example, is eating, whether they're eating or grass fed or whatever, they're getting antibiotics because they're getting sick. Is that correct? Like, exactly. why do the cows get antibiotics? <clears throat> well, the cows are getting sick because they're not being fed properly. Mm. Right. What's What's a cow's normal uh, diet? Grass, I guess. Grass, Cut. alfalfa, and clover. Yeah. Okay? Grass, alfalfa, and clover. That's a cow's normal diet. Right. In America, what is a cow's routine diet? Probably moldy grains. I imagine. Corn. <laughs> right. Corn. Corn. All right? So does corn have all of the nutrients in it no. that the cow needs to actually fare well? No. Not even remotely. Not even remotely. So these cows are malnourished. Mm. And so when you're malnourished, you're much more susceptible to getting sick. And they have reason to be sick because they are living in their own excrement. Because yeah. they are not on the farm. And when they poop, 
They poop right in their stall <clears throat> because they are in the CAFO, C-A-F-O, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. Ugh. And so their risk for disease is much higher. And so the uh, animal husbanders have to give them antibiotics in order to keep them from you know, dropping like flies. Mm. So they continue to grow until the slaughter. Mm. And, you know, of course, their, their, their meat is marbled. There's fat all throughout it. And we love that. We prize our American meat on its marbling because the flavor is in the fat, which is true. <clears throat> the point is that marbling <clears throat> is intramyocellular lipid. That's fat in the muscle. That is metabolic syndrome. This animal has the same disease we do. The only difference is we kill it before it gets sick. Mm. God. Now, if you go to Argentina or you go to Italy and you look at their beef, it is gorgeous, pink, pristine, homogeneous all the way through. Mm. Okay? Because they got brought up on grass and alfalfa and clover. Okay? Right. Beautiful, homogeneous. Now, if you try to cut it with a butter knife, you might have trouble. Because it's so homogeneous, there's a fair amount of sinew, and the muscle is a little, shall we say, stronger, tighter. And so you can't cut it with a butter knife like American meat. We say that that's a virtue, that you, know, you can cut it with a butter knife. In fact, that's actually demonstrating the fragility of that animal. Oh, I'm just sitting in silence and thinking about all the meat that I've eaten that's now seems quite gross. You know, it's yeah. I grew up in um, <laughs> southwestern Australia, lots mm -hmm. of grass, lots of cows, and we we went and we'd pick the cow, shoot the cow. The butcher would come to the house and you know strip, and it was a really different experience. You know, even just yep. seeing how the animal you eat lives. And I grew up spear fishing and catching fish and stuff like that, and then going to a farmed like a salmon farm and you're Indeed. just watching literally just like thousands of fish just eating their own shit and just circling around and then they throw antibiotics to stop them from getting sick and it just goes around and around and around so we're, we're giving sick people sick food exactly and it's just and so what do you expect yeah yeah you, do you expect right. any different so this is why we have to fix the food mm. yeah you absolutely. know I've given you you know, 50 ways from Sunday, you know, the reasons why we have to fix the food. Yeah. But, you know, that means money. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Money is money's what, you know, money talks. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of how you could fix society. All right? When was the very first utterance of the two words, nanny state? Nanny state. Nanny state. I've got no clue. Nanny state. 1979, Lord Balfour in the UK Parliament first brought up the concept of nanny state when the UK Parliament was debating the concept of seatbelts. Mm. Now, seatbelts, as you probably know, Josh, were invented in Australia. Mm -hmm. in 1968. Yeah. Now, why did Australia invent seatbelts? I'm clueless for that one. Did they know that it was going to save lives? Hadn't been done. Mm. How would they know? They didn't, but it seemed like a good public health thing to do. Right. And so they mandated all Australian cars had to be outfitted with seatbelts. In 1968. Yeah. And then it started migrating around the world. Mm. And in the 1970s, the big four, then the big three, now really the big two, you can't, when you count on it, you know, Ford and GM, um, kicking and screaming, no seatbelts. And Lord Balfour basically said, this whole concept of seatbelts is the nanny state. Because... You know, government shouldn't tell people what to do. Yeah. Right? That that was the start of the term. Mm. Right? 
So by 1979, the um, U.S. Congress voted on it, and they had the, um, uh, uh, I forget what the, what the name of the um, bill was, but it was basically the Automobile Transportation Safety uh, Reduction Act or something like that, okay? And they mandated that all vehicles built in America would have to be equipped with seatbelts, mm. okay? Okay. So did seatbelts save lives after that? No, because there was no mandate to wear them. Right. So they were in the cars, but nobody wore them. It wasn't until Mothers Against Drunk Driving started petitioning each state house in every state in the United States throughout the mid-80s into the early 90s that all states passed mandates that you had to wear your seatbelt. Mm. Click it or ticket. it was what they called it, yeah. okay? And so now, do seatbelts save lives? Yes, okay? And can you imagine a car without a seatbelt? No. And if you pull out of your driveway and you haven't clicked your seatbelt, your kids will scream at you. So how did we go from nanny state to your kids screaming at you in 30 years? How'd that happen? It's very simple. We taught the children. The children grew up and they voted. And the naysayers are dead. That's how a generational tectonic shift occurs. And there have been four, count them, four cultural tectonic shifts in America over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And here they are. Number one, bicycle helmets and seatbelts. Number two, drunk driving. Number three, uh, smoking in public places. Number four, condoms in bathrooms. 30 years ago, if a legislator stood up in a state house or in Congress or in uh, Canberra or in the Duma or anywhere else in, you know, in, in, in the world and had, uh, you know, uh, proposed any legislation around any one of these four things. I got left right out of town. Nanny state, liberty interest, get out of my kitchen, get out of my bathroom, get out of my car. Okay? Today, all facts of life. It's crazy. No one's belly aching about seatbelts today. Lord Balfour did, you know, in 1979, <clears throat> but that was 1979. All right? Now, we have new things to bellyache about, like COVID vaccines. Okay, so it's not like the problem ever goes away. It, you know, new problems, all right? But the point is that these things ultimately do get settled. Mm. And the problem of ultra-processed food will get settled. Mm. It will. The question is, how much damage to the populace and how much damage to the environment will we do before it gets settled? Oh, probably a lot, especially given a that lot. we can keep people alive for longer and longer. A it's whole not like you're getting fat and dying. It's like <laughs> right, a whole friggin' boatload. Yeah, right. This is this is the biggest issue mm. right now, the biggest yeah. issue. People say climate's the biggest issue. Well, this is part of climate, and if you fix the food, you'd fix the climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you think of someone's perception around a calorie versus a calorie, if we come back to that question, no, no. how do you define that? And what do we need to know as consumers well, who are looking at the right. back of a box, looking at it and be like, it's 400 calories. So that is the least important thing on that label. Of course, it's the thing that's you know highlighted most. As far as I'm concerned, <clears throat> they should actually remove calories from labels because they're not helpful. It's like the worst thing to know. And the reason is because they can take all the fat out and lower the calories the most, and that'll actually make the food worse. So here are four ways, four reasons why calories are irrelevant. Okay? We're going to take four different items. Let's start with almonds. Okay? You like almonds? Yeah, I love a good toasted almond. Yeah. Crunchy, but Yeah. Almonds are great, right? I love almonds. 
Okay. You eat 160 calories in almonds. How many of those calories do you absorb? I'm not, I'm not educated. I don't have the answer. 130. Wow. Okay. You ate 160. Uh, you absorbed 130. Where'd the other 30 go? Fiber, I guess. The Out fiber, the right? The fiber in the almonds, the soluble and insoluble fiber, form a gel on the inside of the intestine that mm -hmm. prevent early transit from the duodenum into the bloodstream. So it goes to, that would go to the liver. So you're actually protecting the liver. Remember, that's one of the items of, you know, how yes, to sir. fix the ultra processed food, protect the liver. That gel that is set up by the soluble and insoluble fiber. So the insoluble fiber is like a, a fishnet, mm. a lattice work. And the soluble fiber are the, um, uh, plug the holes in the fishnet because they're globular. Together, they form an impenetrable secondary barrier. You can actually see on electron microscopy, coating the inside of the intestine. And that's preventing early transit of those calories from the blood, uh, from the uh, gut into the bloodstream, thus protecting your liver. Well, if you don't absorb them early, where do they go? Well, they go further down the intestine. And that's where the bacteria are, the microbiome. And the microbiome loves almonds. And so we will chew up those for its purposes, not for yours. So even though you consumed it, you didn't absorb it. Even though you consumed it, you didn't get it. So who cares if 160 calories passed your lips? If you didn't absorb it, then it doesn't really matter, does it? So a calorie is not a calorie because if it came with its inherent fiber, that calorie wasn't for you. Mm. It was for your bacteria. Mm. So there's issue number one. Mm -hmm. Issue number two, protein. Now, a lot of your uh, listeners are potential bodybuilders and they consume protein powder. Now, protein powder is 20% branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine. And if you're building muscle, you need those because you can't build muscle without them. Okay, very fair. If you're a bodybuilder, you need protein powder in order to increase muscle mass. But what if you're not a bodybuilder? What if you don't need those? But let's say you consume them anyway because you are eating a thick slab of corn-fed beef and those branched-chain amino acids are in the corn. Okay, That's how the animal got it was by eating the corn. All right? Where do the excess branched-chain amino acids go? You're not building muscle, so where do they go? Tire around your waist. They are going to your liver. Mm. The liver takes the amino group off, deamidates it, and now they've turned the, that branch chain amino acid into a branch chain organic acid. Mm. And then that enters the Krebs cycle, the mitochondrial ATP generation cycle. Got it. it overloads the mitochondria. The mitochondria can't handle the load. And so it shunts the excess off to become fat through a process called de novo lipogenesis, new fat making. So those branched chain amino acids that you consumed are actually increasing liver fat, which is increasing chronic metabolic disease. In addition, if you take an amino acid and turn it into energy, all the way to carbon dioxide and ATP, you actually had to add more energy to get that amino group off than a carbohydrate. Carbohydrate, it costs less. It, for a protein, it costs more. Mm. You get the same number of ATP out of it at the end, but you had to put more in, so there's a net deficit. So a calorie is not a calorie because if, if you were a carb versus an amino acid, okay, you're generating different amounts of ATP. So a calorie is not a calorie because mm -hmm. it depends on where the calories came from as to what happens to them and where they go. Right. Number three. Fats. So over here we have omega threes, heart healthy, anti inflammatory, anti Alzheimer's, save your life. Single best thing you can put in your body omega threes. Over here we have trans fats, the devil incarnate. 
okay, consumable poison by everyone's estimation. They're so, mu they're so poison that the FDA has removed them from the U.S. food supply. Wow. They're both nine calories per gram. Ones that will save your life, one will kill you. How come? Because it has nothing to do with calories. Because mm -hmm. a calorie is not a calorie. And finally, fructose and glucose. So glucose, which is one half of the sugar molecule, is not that sweet. You don't see people going around chugging Cairo syrup, do you? That's glucose. All right? Glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so goddamn important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. That's how important glucose is. So in, glucose is essential. It is just not essential to eat mm. because you will make it. All right? People don't understand that. People think, oh, I got to have sugar in my diet. No, you don't. No, you don't. That is a mistake. Okay? It's a mistake that the food industry wants you to believe, but it's not true. Okay? The Inuit, they didn't have any carbohydrate, didn't have any place to grow a carbohydrate. They had whale blubber, but they still had a serum glucose level because the liver would take the fat and turn it into glucose. They would take the amino acids and turn it into glucose. Mm. Okay? So glucose is important but it's not important to eat. Now, fructose, on the other hand, the sweet molecule in sugar, the addictive molecule in sugar, the molecule that the food industry adds on purpose to hook you, that turns out to be a mitochondrial toxin. It inhibits three separate enzymes in your mitochondria that are necessary to generate ATP. It inhibits AMP kinase, it inhibits ACADL or acyl CoA dehydrogenase long chain, and it inhibits carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, which is the enzyme that regenerates carnitine, which is the shuttle mechanism for getting fatty acids into the mitochondria in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the sum total is that fructose is a dose dependent mitochondrial toxin. Glucose makes your mitochondria work better, fructose makes your mitochondria work worse. They're both four calories per gram. One makes your energy better. One makes your energy worse. Mm. So is a calorie a calorie? No, sir. So bottom line, kill the calorie. Mm. My job is to kill the calorie. Mm. And the more people who understand that, the better I've done my job. Yeah. Now, how am I doing? I don't mean today. How am I doing in general? I, I actually mean, have data. Yeah, I have data. I have data. Yeah. Yeah. I have data. So the food industry has a public relations arm. It's called IFIC, I-F-I-C, the International Food Information Council. Okay? It is purely a PR arm of the food industry, of the processed food industry. Okay? They are the bad guys. But every year they publish a report, an annual report. Every year, they ask the public a question and do a survey. And in 2011, they asked a question. They asked, what component of food or what food stuff causes obesity? That's what they asked. At that time, only 11% of people said refined carbohydrate or sugar. 42% said a calorie is a calorie, or I don't know. Then, seven years later in 2018, they asked the exact same question the exact same way. What food stuff most likely cause obesity? And now 33% of the population said refined carbohydrate and sugar. And an equal number of people decreased, said a calorie is a calorie, or I don't know. Mm. In other words, we educated Amazing. a significant portion of the populace wow. as to what the real story was. Wow. That's incredible. So we know it's working. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that 2023, I think, has been a watershed moment. Yeah. Because people are starting to get the message. Yeah. That's incredible. I can see it. I can see, I can see the ground shifting. Yeah. Thank God. 
because it feels like well it's been a while yeah where did this drive come from rob like where did this like you've been campaigning against you know a very sizable and formidable enemy you know to use that language where did the you know you've been driving against it probably had unbeknown hurdles but continue to strive for the truth and getting this message out there and helping people what's kept you going and kept you maintaining this pace what choice do i have seriously what choice do i have mm. i'm a doctor yeah i'm a pediatrician a pediatrician believes that every kid deserves a shot mm. well every kid right now is behind the eight ball and we put them there who speaks for the children that's what i do yeah was there a moment where this path of life sort of kicked off for you when you were younger you know yeah i don't know um not really you know and, and i'll be honest with you uh, you know i didn't come to this with an agenda mm. You know, this this was not my jam. Not a bit. You know, I went into pediatric endocrinology, you know, after med school to take care of short kids. And then the short kids got fat on me. You know. Um, and, you know, the, the, probably the one thing, you know, so it's, it's, not, it's not like I had a, uh, you know, superhero complex or something, you know, like I had to do good or anything. That's not, that wasn't me. I, you know, I'm basically, I was a, capitalist pediatrician you know interested in you know making an academic name for myself and hopefully parlaying that into a nice nest egg so i you know could afford a house and a and a and a, and a car you know just like just like everybody else okay i wasn't i wasn't any different okay probably the one thing that made a difference was that um for an undergrad i went to mit mm -hmm. in boston in cambridge massachusetts and I majored in nutrition and food science. And so I learned about nutritional biochemistry pretty early in my career. In fact, I was 18 years old. Wow, really? 18, yeah. I went to, I went to uh, college when I was 16. I graduated when I was 19. And so I learned at a very early age that different foods did different things. And that stuck with me. And then I went to medical school and they beat it out of me and told me, oh, none of that's important. That's not how we take care of patients. And a calorie is a calorie. And I said, well, you know, these are the gurus. These are the, you know, people who are, you know, doing the job, you know, they're, they're the doctors, you know, and if I'm going to be a doctor, I better, you know, do what they say. And so I started practicing like it was about calories. And all the kids got fat and I tried to help them and nobody, nobody was being helped. And I'm going like, what the hell is wrong? And then I started doing research in the field starting in 1995. And it started with kids with brain tumors at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital because there's a disorder after a brain tumor is treated where the kid geek becomes massively obese. And it is clearly biochemical. It is called hypothalamic obesity. And I became the world's expert in hypothalamic obesity because I figured out what the cause of it was. The reason this happens to these kids is because the area of the brain that controls energy balance called the hypothalamus is damaged either from the tumor or from the surgery or from the radiation. Right. And because of that, they cannot see the hormone that their fat cells make called leptin, which feeds back on the brain and tells the brain, hey, I don't need to eat so much. Because they can't see their leptin, their brain thinks they're starving all the time. And so they eat everything in sight and they don't burn anything. And so they become massively obese in a very short period of time. That's so sad. And I was faced with 40 of these kids at St. Jude. And I had to figure out how to take care of them. Now, because I'm a neuroendocrinologist, <clears throat> I knew that there was a literature in rats that if you cut the vagus nerve, you can stop these rats from gaining weight. So I knew there was a connection between the hypothalamus and the pancreas through the vagus nerve. So I assumed that the reason cutting the vagus nerve 
worked was by stopping the pancreas from making insulin. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I can't, I can't cut a vagus nerve because I'm not a surgeon. Can I do something as good? Can I do something that I can do? So it turned out there's a drug that I had never used before, but it suppresses insulin release. It's called octreotide. It had been around for many years at that point, but it was normally used to suppress growth hormone release, not suppress insulin release. But we repurposed it and tried to treat these kids with this drug octreotide to see if we could get their insulin down. And if we got their insulin down, would it have an effect on their weight? So this is what we did in 1995. And lo and behold, kids started losing weight. Wow. But not only did they lose weight, which was um, uh, amazing by itself, because these were kids who only gained weight. Okay. Not only did they lose weight, but they started exercising spontaneously. Wow. So I've told, I've told this story on podcasts before, but I'll tell it again. It's kind of the apocryphal story. It's absolutely true, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the story that sort of makes the case. So this is patient number one, the very first patient who ever got octreotide for hypothalamic obesity, okay? A girl weighed 220 pounds with a pineal germinoma, okay? And I told how the mother, she? I said, Sorry, she, was 18, she? she was 17 and a half. That's, inc that's insane. Okay? And I told the mother, look, I've never used this drug before. This is what I think it will do but I want to hear from you in a week and I want to see you in a month. Well, it didn't take a week. It took five days. A phone call, a frantic phone call from the mother. Dr. Lustig, something's happening. Yeah. Oh my God. Adverse event, you know, kids in the ER, you know, study shut down, go to jail. I'm waiting, you know, for the other shoe to drop. What, what, what happened? What happened? And she said, well, normally we would go to Taco Bell and she would eat five tacos and an enchirito and she'd still be hungry. We just went to Taco Bell and she ate two tacos and she was full. And she just vacuumed the house. <laughs> this was a kid who sat on the couch, ate Doritos and slept. Oh my God. She just vacuumed the house. Now, how did that happen? I didn't tell her to vacuum the house. <laughs> she had enough energy to vacuum the house because she wasn't storing it. Mm. You can either burn it or you can store it. Insulin makes you store it. We were lowering her insulin, so she now had it to burn. And so we looked at the other patients, and guess what? They also started being physically active. Incredible. One kid became a competitive swimmer. Two kids started lifting weights at home. One kid became the manager of his high school basketball team. These were kids who ran around the, you know, uh, uh, sat on the couch and ate, uh, uh, and, and, ate and, and slept, and that's it. You know, the parents would say, you know, this is double jeopardy because, you know, I lost my kid to the therapy, not the tumor. Yeah. You know, not fair. But now they're saying, I got my kid back. And one kid said, this is the first time my head hasn't been in the clouds since the tumor. Oh, my God. This is pretty remarkable. So we did it again. This time we built a, <clears throat> we did it with a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and we built in a quality-of-life questionnaire. And indeed, we showed <clears throat> that the lower we got the insulin, the more physically active the patient was. Mm. And then we did it in adults without brain tumors and found a subset of obese adults who responded the same way. So what we had done is we identified a subtype of obesity that was due to insulin, that was due to the vagus nerve driving the beta cell to make insulin that could be interrupted by getting the insulin released down or by cutting the vagus nerve and by reversing the process. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody with obesity has that reason, but some do. And so this would be a bona fide method for treatment. Amazing. So this is what started me in obesity research. 
And what it also proved to me is the biochemistry drives the behavior. Mm. So everyone who wants to say that it's the obese person's fault, how do you explain these kids? Yeah, fuck. When you're that young, I, it's insane. Why do we have an epidemic of newborn obesity if it's about gluttony and sloth? Mm. How come newborns are obese now? Mm. Four studies, U.S., South Africa, Russia, Israel. Over the last 25 years, birth weight has gone up 500 grams. 500 grams. Okay, that's a pound. And when you do DEXA scanning on them, what is that weight? It's fat. Mm. Why are babies being born fat? They don't diet and exercise. God, that's so sad. So that's why I do what I do. Yeah, man. That's why yeah. what keeps me going. Okay? Yeah. I am the bullshitterator. <laughs> I have to get rid of the bullshit. Yeah. Because as long as people believe it, we'll never fix the problem. Yeah, that's crazy. That's insane. Do you have suggestions for you know, for someone who's listening and they're like, Oh, I need to kick start the vagus nerve or something without a drug intervention like that? Do you have yeah, some not yet. tips for someone to get that started or not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, you know, the people are experimenting with that. Um, mm. um we we actually um did a study where we uh, uh, subjected adults to vagotomy, to laparoscopic wow. truncal vagotomy back in 2005. And what we saw was that a percentage of the patients lost nine kilos, about 20 pounds, and kept it off. Now, nine wow. kilos is not enough, but it was, it was certainly better than nothing. But not every patient responded. And unfortunately, um, the study ended up being a problem because it was done in two sites and one site lost the, the blood samples. Really? Really. Wow. Yeah, it, it wasn't that they lost it. It, it, it was just a bad, bad karma. Um, they had collected all the blood samples, put them on, you know, in, in a minus 70 freezer like they're supposed to. And then it was time to ship them to the lab to get them uh, analyzed. And the technician in the lab who was preparing the samples for shipping thought, oh, I can put just a little bit of dry ice in the box. Not realizing that as soon as the uh, box goes up in the, uh, in the airplane, all the dry ice sublimates. So you have to fill that dry ice to the absolute top mm -hmm. in order to keep those specimens frozen. Wow. Well, by the time the... Uh, plane landed all the specimens were thawed ah, bugger well if you're looking back on the last 12 months what's something that you're really proud of that has gone really well some work that you put in well um i am the chief medical officer of four companies and um a paid advisor to six others Mm. And the good news is that all of them are doing well. <laughs> and right. I'm proud of all of them. Wow. It, unfortunately for me, because they're all doing well, I have to do more. <laughs> so I'm very busy. But, um, and they're all designed in one way or another to impact different nodes of the food supply. Mm -hmm. So one is a longevity company called Kalen Health, where we sell a dietary supplement uh, called spermidine. And it turns out spermidine promotes autophagy, and autophagy is essential for improving chronic uh, metabolic disease. A second one is called Biolumin, which is a proprietary fiber company, which sequesters glucose, fructose, sucrose, simple starches, and renders them unavailable for absorption early on. In other words, they're doing what uh, Biolumin is doing what fiber normally does. We are replacing the fiber in the diet. We are turning apple juice back into apples back in the intestine without actually having to affect the juice itself. Got it. 
So potentially, you know, adding it to food like chocolate or uh, um, uh, bean dip or um, uh, microwave lasagna in order to be able to increase the fiber content and have it do metabolic good. Uh, a, 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 uh, an app called Perfect, Perfect, P-E-R-F-A-C-T dot co. And what that is, is, is it's a um, uh, computerized recommendation engine that works with your grocery store so that you can actually shop your grocery store and only see the items in the grocery store that fit your biochemical profile. Mm. Because wow. there are 90,000 90, items in your grocery store, okay? And almost 80,000 of them will kill you. Mm -hmm. And you right. only want to see the 10,000 that are actually healthy for you. Right. And so Wild. we can do that, and we can do it for any biochemical profile. So yeah. if you have metabolic syndrome, if you have gout, if you have kidney stones, if you have renal disease, if you have multiple sclerosis, if you have anything, we can basically make your food metabolically healthy. That's incredible. So that's kind of cool. List. That is pretty cool. Um, another company called Fugle, another company called Fugle, which basically works with your insurance company to basically um, provide you with recipes and meals that are metabolically healthy and charging the insurance company the cost of the food. Food is medicine. Wow. Levels Health, which you've probably heard of, mm -hmm. which uses continuous glucose monitoring data yeah. to get yeah. rid of the glucose spikes in order to improve metabolic health. Yeah. They are doing phenomenally well. I'm very proud of them. Amazing. Okay? And several others that uh, uh, are, are uh, uh, moving along. Uh, uh, Ketone Monitor, Journeys Metabolic, um, uh, a uh, mushroom company called Mycotechnologies, um, uh, a uh, dietary therapeutics company called Simplex Health. So you can see that it's a, it's a busy, uh, busy time. You got your hands full, man. You're an absolute inspiration. And thank I you do. for taking the time to come and talk with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Josh.